Hey duck fans, Kurt here. Welcome to yet another fish duck one on one. Wide receiver Joe Reitzig. He personified Oregon athletics in the 80s and 90s. He wasn't the biggest guy or the fastest or the strongest, but he maximized the talents that he did possess to achieve greatness. Consistently making some of the most remarkable acrobatic catches in Oregon Ducks history. From 86 to 90, Joe was guaranteed to wow you at least once a game, making the unbelievable look routine with jaw-dropping catches, becoming a favorite target of Bill Musgrave. It's such a pleasure to welcome him now to the Fish Duck 101, Joe Reitzig. How you doing, Joe? I'm doing great, Kurt. Thanks for having me. Oh, it, this is fantastic. Uh, as I told you before, I, I will try not to go super fanboy on you, but on a personal <laughs> level, it's a huge thrill for me to talk to you. I grew up watching you. You are my all-time favorite Oregon Duck player. And I, I got to tell you, I'm really flattered, and I really appreciate that. Well, the reason why you are my all-time favorite player is growing up watching you, you, every game would go out there and just make the amazing look routine. You would make the, the sideline toe-tapping catch. You'd make the deep touchdown flying through the air like a ballerina, and you'd get up like it was no big deal. How in the world did you so nonchalantly <laughs> shrug it off like it was no big deal when you defied physics and gravity time and time again. <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things where, um, you know, I, it started when I was a, a, a young boy in Indiana. And, you know, in Indiana, they, we lived in a neighborhood that had a ton of trees. And so we would rake all the leaves out of the way and we'd have a playing field, but then you'd have these leaves on the sidelines and in the end zones so that you could run and make those grabs and jump into the leaves and doing all that. You know, when I was uh, five, six, seven, eight years old, that's what we did. And as we got older, um, I don't know, I just kind of developed uh, something where uh, maybe I just wasn't smart enough to know that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> when you're going over the middle and you're going to make a catch and they're throwing you the ball, I was always taught and I always focused in on 100% focus on what you were doing. And if that meant catching the ball and then realizing that you had, you know, Eric Turner from UCLA, Junior Seau from SC, Mark Carrier from SC, these guys bearing down on you, trying to take your head off, well, you know, you got to make the catch and then what happens after that happens. I guess I just didn't know better. And I really, uh, I, I, I'm extremely competitive, like a lot of the guys uh, in my recruiting class in 86. You know, and uh, guys like Bill Musgrave and uh, Tony Hargain, Michael McClellan, you know, Derek Lavelle, uh, those guys were not going to be denied. And I certainly wasn't going to be the one that came up short. And, um, you know, we all kind of fed off of that. And uh, it was my job to bring the ball down and make the catches when, when they called on me. So, Well, somehow, some way kind of defines you as a player because you came in in the midst of what I think is a real watershed moment in Oregon sports. And that was the 1986 football re recruiting class. You mentioned some of the names. Bill Musgrave, Derek LaVille, Latin Berry, Terry Obi, Tony Hargain. So many NFL players came out of that, that group. And you as a wide receiver came in and you're looking at Terry Obi, who has world-class speed, and Tony Hargain, who's the NFL model build of raw physical athletic talent. Right. And here's Joe Reitzig, the walk-on. And you earned your way onto the field, you earned playing time, extensive playing time, and really became the favorite target of Bill Musgrave, who set every passing record there was at, at Oregon. How were you able to work your way up the depth chart into getting a chance to play alongside guys like Obi and Hargain and Sam Archer and, and McClellan, world-class talents at, at wide receiver? Um... <laughs> Hey, you know, that's that's a good question, and um, part of it, I think, uh, just goes to some opportunity, and um, my true freshman year, I actually traveled a few games because we were so depleted with injuries. Um, you know, J.J. Burden, Rod Green, Jan Cespedes, all those guys um, were dinged up in one way or another, and, um, you know, I, I came in, and as a freshman, you know, it goes back to really... Um, when I was younger, I did not, for whatever reason, I just did not get phased by the environment or who I was playing against or anything. It was just football, and I was playing, and if they throw me the ball, I'm going to do it. If they teach me something, I'm going to learn it type of thing, and, um, you know, that served me well. And uh, as I came around and, and got a little bit more experience, um, 
you know, I learned uh, the offense very quickly. I learned um, how to execute the offense and not make mistakes and also do the little things. I really love blocking because, like, like I mentioned before, you get to be the hammer and not the nail. And, and um, so that's a big thing, but also uh, consistently making the catch. And I think, you know, when you, when you come up in the Pac-10, you, you face a different level of competition that you did in high school. And I'm not saying that I had great competition where I was coming from. Um, we had some good competition, but, you know, when you catch the ball consistently, when you are in the place where you're supposed to be consistently, and you're constantly working as hard as you can, that gets noticed. And um, I just happened to, to get in the right position at the right time. And, uh, you know, I was lucky that I was with a program that was where they were in time uh, for me to get opportunities. I don't think that would have happened out of Washington. Right, I don't think a walk on <laughs> got to where they were, and right. maybe I don't know at that time, probably not. Some of the other programs, probably not. But at Oregon, they were all about uh, bottom line production, and if you could play, you were going to play. And, and Coach Brooks, um, who um, is an amazing man, amazing coach, and I have all the respect in the world for him, was one of those guys that. He didn't care what your name was or what it said on your jersey and your stat line and, and your media book. If you were going to go out and play and play hard and play as a team, uh, he'd take you on his team and, and you'd get on the field eventually. Well, for you, uh, you know, teams can recruit guys who run a 4-3 speed, but there's not a lot of guys that are able to catch literally everything that is thrown in their general direction and to do all the little things that you did certainly block and decoy and and float through the air like a ballerina I, I can't say that enough you were the most airborne receiver I've, I've ever seen in my life you spent more time in the air than you did on, on the ground right. but was that something that coaches worked with you on or did it just kinda come naturally and, and how did the coaches help you to become a better player uh, my coach John Ramsdale uh, was a very good coach and still is a good coach. I think he's with uh, the Chargers right now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but he uh, he was Rammer was a very uh, different style of coaching. But as far as you know, the acrobatics and this or that or anything, no. I mean, it was all bottom line. You make the catch, you do what you have to do um, to get it done. And so uh, as far as how you make the catch? No, they they were just you know you make the catch, and however you do it is up to you. A lot of times, um, you know, Bill Bill was uh, Bill had a great sense of humor or has a great sense of humor, and he's just uh, <laughs> there were sometimes we'd be watching film, and I remember I ran an out and up against uh, I forget who was it against it was at Autzen, and uh, I beat the guy bad very bad and he loped it out he launched it out there pretty good and I was going down the sidelines fast as fast as I could and I thought I'm gonna go 80 on this thing <laughs> and I look up and the ball is overthrown and I dive and stretch all the way out and make the catch and come down and you know the game goes on I think we won the game we're watching film on Sunday or Monday and Bill I'm sitting next to him and he kinda elbows me and he goes you know if you were a little better athlete, we would have gone 80 yards on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Everyone Bill. Pat me on the back. Great catch, Joe. Great. Nice play, this and that. And Bill kind of looks at me. He's like, real athlete would have caught that in the street. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's times when you and uh, old teammates get together at a game, start looking around and thinking, it would have been nice to have had this when I was playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, there's always a little bit of that. But, you know, I never... Uh, there's not a lot of that because everything that uh, is at that stadium now was hard earned. Uh, the respect that they get now has been hard earned over many, many, many years. And, uh, you know, I'm just happy to have been a, a little itty bitty part of it. And uh, it's always fun to, to reminisce and talk about it and uh, get to kind of um, be happy about where they're at now. What a difference a year makes between your junior and senior year. Because you're dealing with those locker rooms and crossing the street and, and everything. And then senior year comes around, Casanova Center. All of a sudden you have a legitimate weight room. You have a legitimate locker room. How, how much of a culture shock was it when you got accustomed to the way it was and then all of a sudden here's the Casanova Center. Enjoy. 
Well, the cast center wasn't finished by the start of uh, fall camp. It had uh, the locker rooms were finished, and uh, I think the weight room was pretty much finished, if I remember right. But the treatment center in there uh, was not finished. Um, and I remember we had uh, <laughs> we had a team meeting, and the captains and the reps for each of the classes after practice one day uh, at the end of fall camp. Coach Brooks said. Uh, you know, we got our captain's meeting, our representative's meeting. We're going to meet out here. And, um, you know, Coach Brooks, we had one of those practices where, I don't know, sometimes it just didn't go the way he wanted. You know, I thought we always practiced great. But, Coach, <laughs> sometimes it didn't go according to his plan. And I think we had one of those practices. And we had our meeting. And he said, all right, we're going to take a vote. You guys can vote for who wants to stay in our old locker rooms. And who wants to move to the new locker rooms? Make the vote. Let me know how it goes. And he walked off. And so we're all sitting there, and we're looking at each other, and we're like, should we be debating this? Or, <laughs> or we're going to move into the new locker rooms, right? And we kind of look at each other, and we're like, yeah, okay, great. Meeting adjourned. Let's get out of here. We're moving into the new locker rooms, you know? So um, we went in there, and yeah, I mean, it was the Taj Mahal compared to where we were. And uh, we're all very thankful, and... Um, you know, it was one of those things that people that came to the stadium for the game day, also the visiting teams um, and the recruiting that they were able to do around that, uh, it made an instant impact, and uh, it was money well spent. So they did a great job with it. Independence Bowl aside, that's the, the one bowl victory that you got, so certainly that's a, a benchmark. Do you have mm -hmm. a personal favorite game? Certainly there are some from the, the fan perspective that stand out, the 90 BYU game. Being mm -hmm. a top five team and the eventual Heisman Trophy winner, maybe a uh, personal favorite play. I know you were featured on ESPN as a play of the the week, and yeah. um, just any individual memories from games that really stand out to you. Um, I, I BYU was a lot of fun. BYU was a ton of fun, and uh, just the the shootout with with Detmer was very interesting to watch because we we had a, a really good defense and we'd come off the field. And then all of a sudden it was like, all right, we're up. Here we go. And <laughs> we'd go down the field and score. And then, uh, you know, we get on the bench and they, oh, they got another touchdown. We got to go out there. It was just back and forth, back and forth. And um, that was one of those games where uh, they couldn't stop us. There was, there was no way that they were going to stop us. And their corners were um, – both ended up being pretty good players. But I think one of the guys was pretty young. And we were just turning him around like a top. And the other guy was a little bit older, but he just could not figure out the double move, the post corner. So, I mean, if you watch the tape of those games, there's the pattern. We were running the same patterns over and over and over. Um, but that one was a satisfying one because they... Uh, 89, they, they beat you. So. 89, they beat us. Um, and 90 was real satisfying because in 89, they talked a ton. They had a linebacker that was all whack or whatever, and he was talking a ton in the game. And one of my favorite plays was we did a crack screen, and on that play, I get to come down, and uh, if the outside linebacker comes, then I go to the middle linebacker, and the, the, their big stud was the middle linebacker. And I hit him so hard that I hit him, and I remember the next thing I saw was his feet up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember getting up, and I remember the other BYU linebacker looking at me like, golly. <laughs> and, you know, he was looking out of his ear hole a little bit. And he was all upset, saying that he was going to find me and this and that. You know, and that, that's a fun when you're the little guy in the field and right. you can get a big guy like that all riled up. Right. Um. But, yeah, I mean, that game was a lot of fun. 90, we came back, and 90 was very workmanlike, very businesslike. It was just, hey, listen, this is what we're going to get done. And that was another one of those games where it was national TV, and we were just going to get the job done, and it was a good feeling. Uh, your time as a Duck, 86 through 90, and then, as you said, you went into coaching for a little while. Um, but tell us a little bit about post-college life for Joe Reitzig. A lot of the lessons that I learned from my time, 86 to 90, at, in Eugene, um, have been very, uh, very good lessons for life later on. Um, you know, I coached uh, high school for a few years. I coached small college up at Western Washington for a year. And then I went to U of O and coached 93, 94 and went to the Rose Bowl with Coach Brooks and his staff. 
And, um, you know, I, I have a, a, a great amount of respect for what professional football coaches do. And the coaches uh, at the university are true professionals. And uh, they dedicate their lives to uh, enriching the lives of those players and getting a product on the field that's going to win games for the university and represent the university. That being said, you spend a ton of time uh, like no other um, job you'll ever see preparing for and living for every single test on Saturday. And then in the off season, you spend a ton of time. And um, it's not uh, conducive to having a family. And uh, for me personally, uh, I wanted to have kids. I wanted to be in one city uh, and not be in Lubbock, Pocatello, in you know, all the different places that you have to go as a coach. Um, so I made the choice to get out of coaching and I went into real estate and I was a real estate broker uh, from 95 uh, until today. I still have my license. I sold for a number of years and then uh, had my own company and then went back to my company John L. Scott Real Estate and uh, got into management and now I'm the regional vice president for Oregon and Southwest Washington for the company and I'm responsible for all operations in, uh, in Oregon and Vancouver. So, what, what do you want people to remember of your playing days? I'd like people to appreciate how hard the players played and practiced and prepared for what they saw on Saturdays. And there was a ton uh, of work behind the scenes that uh, you know you never see. And there were a ton of really, really good players and really, really uh, good young men that they didn't see on Saturday. And um, you know, it, it's one of those things where um, if you liked football back then, uh, what you see now, um, you've got to love and always be positive. I've been to a lot of stadiums and been around a lot of other schools' fans. And, uh, you know, I, I got to say um, two thumbs up to Duck fans because uh, from 86 when I started there till now, I, I couldn't be more proud. And uh, the other thing is thank you. Thank you for everything that, that the, uh, the Duck faithful have done all the money they contribute, all the time they contribute, and all the passion that they give for the program because uh, it's a pretty special thing. I mean, you see it at, when you go to the games and, and the people that you talk to, it is a passionate, passionate thing now. And uh, it's certainly something special that we should, uh, we should cherish and also uh, protect and make sure that, uh, that it's done the right way. Uh, the mindset, the lifestyle, uh, the way people treat each other, you know, you get tagged as the, the hippie place and this and that and all that. And, you know, that's from people that have ne either never been there or can't appreciate um, that, type of, uh, that type of community. And uh, I, it, I've been to all the Pac-10 um, campuses and spent some time at all the Pac-10 uh, communities uh, as well as a bunch of other schools around the country. There is not a better community to send your son to play college football and to be coached at and to get an education at, uh, in my mind. And I've seen a ton of them. And uh, the combination of um, the community, the university, and the athletic staff uh, is rare. And it's a, it's a neat thing. And that's really uh, has a lot to do with the recruiting success that they've had now. Obviously, winning a ton of games does not hurt. It helps. And playing, yeah, it helps. And playing um, a certain style, both offensive and defensively, helps. But in the end, people are only going to choose to go to a place where they feel wanted and they feel like it's going to be a good place for them to, to grow during some very important years. And uh, Eugene should be very proud because they've created that community there. And uh, it's special. I, I love it there. Thank you, Joe, so much for joining us on the Fish Duck One-on-One. -on -one. And uh, as always, go Ducks. Go Ducks. <laughs>